If it was a snake, it would have bit me. Wow, Janet, way to clear the room. I know. <laughs> Dang. All right. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> okay. That's all right. right. All right. That's okay. It's okay. Take the so I'm Janet. And I'm Scott. And we, and we are, are here, here to pump you up, up about VR. <laughs> oh, boy, that was a heavy eye roll. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. I made him do that. I made him she do made that. She made me do that. <laughs> hey, can we get everybody to stand up for a minute? We've been sitting, right? <clears throat> Listening. Uh, we're a little bit more interactive. Um, all right, who here uses VR headsets? Hey, wow. Okay, you guys can all leave. That's no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, let's see. What else? What else who, who has had your boss in a VR headset? Oh, yeah. Who's had your CEO in a headset? All right. Okay, some. Awesome. Great. Okay. And I really like the emphasis of, um, hey, we really like to work with IT. Yeah. Do you want to hear our IT experience? It was no. <laughs> yeah. We wanted to put the VR headsets on the network. They just said, no, we can't. It's too much of a security risk. Yeah. Anyways, said, we'll tell you more network. about that later. Yeah. So, so let's get started. We came here last year to this conference, and my eyes were huge. And I was like, Scott, Scott, what's the metaverse? What is XR? I, I had no idea yeah, what was going I, I, on. I played Beat Saber, you know, a couple of times at my friend's house. Uh, but that was it. The rest of the time, I was like, well, Janet, as a matter of fact, <laughs> XR, extended <laughs> reality. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of an eye-opener for both of us. So even though we had uh, already started doing some VR uh, at our company, um, we were still newbies. So that's kind of my, my point is very is much you know new to VR. Very much new. Experienced instructional designers. Scott has a lot of uh, emphasis in uh, videography, graphic graphics, design, stuff like that. 3D animation. My background is adult learning theory, um, but we we didn't really know anything about VR AR when we got started. That's so right. if we did it, you guys can too. Um, Scott's going to talk a little bit about our timeline. Yeah, this is a really quick timeline. As you can see, it's like seven months. Um, we had a, my, our director come in from a conference and say, hey, we, I saw this really cool thing, at a demo at the conference. Here's the website. Check it out. What do you think? Within a day, we were like, hey, this is really cool. This could fill a gap. And uh, they, uh, we got them to come visit within a couple of weeks. And within a couple of weeks after that, we had four tester headsets that we were running around doing tons and tons of demos with everybody to try and um, get some buy-in. And we began customizing it with a subject matter expert. We talked about that in our, in our last meeting. Uh, anyways, we talked about that for a while. We got customized. Um, and then by August, we were implementing with our new pilots. Uh, we had huge, tremendous uh, feedback anxiety. But what we found out was that everybody really loved it, and especially the older pilots who we thought would be pushing back a lot more, they really loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was uh, one of the important things we did. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when we implemented it with the new pilots, we got lots and, and lots of feedback. And then we went to our vendors, who we really love. And we would give them that feedback, and they would tweak the program. And we've gotten it to where it's really quite user friendly now. So what are we doing with VR in yeah, our that's pilot it right training? There. Yeah. That's uh, in the background picture. That's our um, automated crew member. Um, so we're not doing everything. Somebody this morning said something about don't boil. You don't need to boil the ocean. It's oh, like, yeah. You don't need to build the world. What we're not doing is building a fully functional 737 that people go and fly. It's not a free play. Uh, it's a pretty specific um, task that we have. So when a pilot gets in an aircraft, there's a series of switches and buttons and things they have to set or test or check or turn on or whatever um, throughout the whole flight, pre-flight, takeoff, um, after flight, the whole thing. And those are called flows, and the pilots have to memorize them. So ideally, of course, we'd be doing that in like a fully set up, fully functional flight simulator. But those things are very, very expensive. And they are just packed. The schedule for the simulators is just packed with people doing actual flight training. So we don't have it available. 
So in the past, pilots have used manuals with just a flat piece of paper to study their flows. Or if you were really, really highbrow, like our friend Toby, um, he built the picture in the middle uh, out of cardboard boxes that he taped panels to in his dining room. Um, that's a, we call a paper tiger. But this is literally how pilots used to study for their flows. Um, and when we got into the headsets, our program can, allows you to go through all of the flows, but you can't do it wrong. So we don't have any negative training on it. There's some visual cues, there's a purple river, and there's some lighted switches and things so they can follow it through. But they're able to sit in the headsets and do as many times as they want before they go to the expensive simulator sessions. And if you guys are interested, we'll be showing it off a little bit afterwards in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Well, OK, so we're getting right into it now. Now we're into the, what did we learn, right? Uh, this was a really quick turnaround, happened really fast. Um, there's Captain Practical, right, on time. We, we, you, you can't always pick the new shiny thing, right? The new shiny thing doesn't always, isn't always the best tool for the job. Um, and we had to be that practical person that said, hey, you know, um, this is a really good, VR is a really good fit for a lot of things, but it may not be good as a simulator, right? Maybe it needs to be just something that the pilots sit in and practice their procedures. Um, what we did find was that what we did get filled a gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fill the gap. So um, you know what they say about if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's really easy to look at VR, AR. It's flashy, it's cool, it's sexy, uh, and people want to use it but it's not appropriate for everything. What you want to do is find a gap where this is the best tool to fill that gap. So for us, we, our gap was we didn't have enough simulators for the pilots to sit in, but we could have just as many simulators as we want in VR. Mm -hmm. So it really 100% filled a gap for us. Uh, it's something that offers value that other tools don't. A video is not the same thing. It's not going to give you the muscle memory. It's not going to give you the spatial orientation in the flight deck the way the VR does. Um, and it's making it a lot easier for our pilots when they go into uh, the flight deck for their first simulator session with their instructor. So yeah, that's our AI generated Captain Practical there. We have a term at Alaska Airlines in pilot training called brain width. And the idea is that you have X amount of processing power in your brain. So if you go into your first simulator session that's $4,000 an hour to run the sim and however many at dollars an hour to have an instructor. Thousands. Yeah, thousands. Um, how much of your brain power is being used going, where is that switch and which switch is next? We don't want uh, our new pilots to go in to the sim session and not be able to find things. We don't want them to be nervous going in and be like, oh my god, I don't know where anything is. I'm so embarrassed. Pilots are very competitive. We want them to walk in, know where everything is, go through their flows quickly so that their brain width, they've got like 90% of it available to learn the important things that only the instructor can do. Um, to get in extra takeoffs, to get in extra landings, all of those really, really important things that you can't simulate outside uh, of a sim event with a face-to-face -face instructor. Um, so that's one of the really important things that we want to do. And also now that we're getting, um, we're changing the way that we're thinking about how we train pilots. It used to be uh, a weed out process. You would get hired in, and if you made it through the program, great. If not, better luck next time. Nowadays, we can't afford to do that. We have uh, every airline mm -hmm. is trying to get as many pilots as they can. So now we're having to step in and use the VR headsets as a way to buffer or help some of the pilots who maybe uh, haven't flown in a jet before. Maybe they've only been in uh, uh, flying in Alaska in the bush, right? And they're coming in now. Maybe they've gone to Horizon Airlines first. But then they've got to come to us, and we've got to help them fill that gap. We're there to support them now. We're not there to weed them out. And I still have to remind people that almost mm -hmm. on a weekly basis. Yeah. We're there to give them as many supportive tools as we can. And that's something that you really can't. Um, everybody's talking about ROI and stuff like that. There are a lot of things that you can't quantify. You cannot put a dollar number on, for example, showing pilots that the company is investing in you. 
We are investing in new technology because we want you to be the best pilot that you can be. Um, and that's something that you just really can't put a dollar amount on. Um, but Although it is I did important. the math really quickly. Oh, you did? Yeah, roughly in the back of my head while you were talking. Um, $4,000 an hour flight simulator. It, say you save a half an hour of that time. They're not sitting there in that simulator going, oh, gosh, I wish I knew where the hydraulic switch was. Right? They've done that in the VR headset. They've done it as many times as they need to. They've got it memorized now. Now, they've, they're saving a half an hour to an hour. There's $1,000, $2,000 yeah. every, for every single student. That's extra takeoffs and landings. Extra takes off, takeoffs and landings, yeah. and that's what um, our bosses are looking mm -hmm. for. Those pilots need to have those extra takeoffs and landings, and if we can provide that, that's even better. Yeah, we had some pilots come in. We were uh, uh, bringing down our Airbus fleet, phasing it out, and um, all of our Airbus pilots are transitioning to Boeing. Um, and I overheard some of our most experienced Airbus pilots who are now like uh, brand new to the 737. And I overheard them talking to you know, each other after a session in the VR saying, oh wow, I feel so much more confident. I was really nervous about going in in front of all these other instructors and not knowing where things were. And again, that is something that you just can't put a dollar amount on. Okay. So well, another thing we learned. And this is the other thing that we learned. Well, it was, it was less of a lesson learned as it was, um, we didn't really have a choice. It was like, hey, the director says, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We just have to figure out how we're going to do it. Um, and you could, like the first bullet says, you could re research the hell out of it, and everybody has. We even talked about analysis paralysis. It happens. It's, it happens everywhere. Um, we were a little bit lucky, I guess, in a way, in that... Um, we didn't get to analyze too much other than, yes, this will work, this will fill a gap, and I think this is an important uh, thing that we can do. Um, we didn't wait until it was perfect either, because it wasn't really perfect. It was a generic 737 model. Mm -hmm. um, we needed to have it customized for us, so it needed to look, it needed to have our features on the inside, and it needed to follow our procedures, and that's what our subject matter experts were for. Uh, mm -hmm. They quickly went through the whole manual, sat down in the headset, and wrote it all out. They must have spent two weeks writing it all out, and within another week or so, we had it all updated. It was yeah. a really quick turnaround. It was really fast, yeah. Um, well, one of the things, um, oh man, what was I going to say? Oh, don't wait till it's perfect. So, for example, when we put it out, some of the user, face, user interface was clunky. And yes. um, it took, took longer than it needed to we for had to people build to get the, into it. You know, the play area and all that. And we were having the pilots having a real hard time going, oh, I don't know how to put my, pilot, <laughs> my play area together. Yeah. So plan to evolve uh, to what it needs to be. When you kick it out the door, might not be perfect. It won't be perfect. Even if you research it forever and think it's perfect, it's not. You're going to hear something back from the users. No plan um, survives the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so you're definitely going to want to um, plan on uh, this evolving. One of the lucky things for us, we started small. The, the software vendor um, and the program that they had built was very focused on pilot flows. Um, and, and that helped us get it out the door quickly, because all we had to do was customize it. We weren't building it from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So somebody earlier this afternoon talked about the um, instructional model, the ADDIE design, um, where you analyze your learning problem, design your solution, develop your materials, and then implement it. For us, the most important thing is to evaluate it. You kick it out the door, and then you get feedback on it. How well is it working? What do we need to change to make it work better? Well, one thing that really surprised us was age, the stereotype yes. about age. We thought, we thought the older pilots, the retired, seasoned <clears throat> instructor pilots would be like, yeah, back in my day, we didn't need this kind of stuff. But they were the ones that were the most receptive. They absolutely loved it because they could see the value in it. And the younger students, the younger pilots, some of them were like, I'm not even going to do this. Or some of them, being the competitive pilots they are, pretended to do it. <laughs> Um, and, of course, you've heard it from everybody else, you need to keep data. Um, and we haven't done the very best job on that. We're still tweaking how we get the data. Uh, our colleague over at Horizon, Alan, you can do your princess wave, Alan Gatormson, uh, he's done a much better job than we have with data. So if you want to talk to somebody about that, that's him. Um, 
But the one thing we didn't do was keep data ahead of time before we introduced the VR. So we've got the post data that we kind of are looking at, but we don't really have anything before we implement it, it so to compare quick. it to, because it happens so Just quickly. Boom, hey, guess we're doing VR. Yeah. So um, before you implement it, you know, plan ahead and take some pre-VR da uh, pre data so you have something to compare it against. Mm -hmm. Did I get everything? Mm-hmm. Okay. Ah, yes, the other duties. Um, this is sort of touches on the scaling that we talked about earlier, not us, but that we've been listening to. Um, we started with four headsets and thought, oh, four headsets are great, let's do 30. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, okay, well, there's, there's some manpower involved in charging. Where are we gonna put them? Oh, we've got to take them to the classroom, so we need to make whatever we're getting portable. Oh, and this is just out of COVID, so we have to make sure that whatever we put it in needs to sterilize everything. Oh, and we have to buy wipes too, Clorox mm -hmm. wipes, because we have everybody wipe them down after they use it. So there's that level, and that's mm -hmm. just the logistics part. Mm -hmm. Then there's the people. We have SME, subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. They're going to be doing a bunch of stuff. We have to help schedule them in. They also fly. So we have to schedule it sort of in their off time, mm -hmm. and there's some agreements that they have to follow, so we have to plan ahead for that. Um, what else is there um, so much? Yeah, like who's buying the batteries for the controllers, and you know, who's making sure that we have a case of, of you know, disinfectant wipes? Um, mm -hmm. Who's making sure that when the software updates that all the headsets are updated? Oh my gosh, who's keeping updating track 30. of sign in, check in, check out, making sure that the mm -hmm. headsets haven't walked out the door. And who's, who's studying the data? Who's collecting the data? How yeah. are we collecting the data? We talked about it a little bit before, but this is mm -hmm. sort of the logistics part of how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Right now we're using uh, QR codes and uh, it's sort of a back end of um, Office 360 to sort of build a survey and answer questions and, and then how we, we have to collect that data and we have to store that someplace. And then now we're gonna be using some reports to analyze all of that stuff mm -hmm. too. And then there's the life cycle of the equipment itself. Oh my gosh. How yes. long will it last? What do we do when it breaks? What happens if it breaks? What happens yeah. when we want to upgrade to Pico 4s? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with our Pico 3s? Where are they going to go? Right now we're talking about donating them. Maybe there's a university that would like them. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. We'll donate them to Washington State University. Go Cougs. Yeah. So, um, so that was a big learning um, uh, learning point for us. Is you, you have to plan on resources. You have to carve out time for your subject matter expert to work with your vendors to ensure that your content is 100% correct. Um, we have, we're lucky, we have Esther. Esther, can you give your princess wave? Um, she does a lot of the um, headset wrangling, um, and I wouldn't say it's half of her job, but I would say that it's a, a significant part of her job. And once a week, she and other members of our team are wheeling the carts down to the classrooms. and Every morning um, at eight o'clock. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. nice and busy. But it's been good and it's been worth it. Another thing that's really important, and we've heard this from other folks as well, creating buzz. You've got to go out and show people what this is. Um, say yes to demos anytime you can. Somebody walks in your office and they're like, hey, these are the headsets. Especially if it's leadership, say, oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have time? Do you have yeah. 15 minutes? We'll show you how it works. The FAA was walking by. We're like, hey. Yeah. Come on Our in. COO was walking by. Hey, I'd love to show you the headsets. And yeah. she's like, oh, sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> but we got on our calendar. Yeah, so, we did. Um, yeah, and, and it's the VR AR thing, as you guys all know, it's one of those things that doesn't, you can't really explain it well. Um, even a video of what they're doing in the headset is not the same as being immersed in the environment. So it's really important to get your leadership in the headsets. Um, our, we got our VP, who's a pilot, in a headset, and all of a sudden it was like, oh. And that wow factor, it's amazing. Yeah. When you put, you put people into the headsets for the first time and they're like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa, yeah. I'm, in the, I'm in the flight deck. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah, and people forget and try to put their arms on the armrest. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. not 100%, they reach right? reach around it's, the yoke. It's not photo perfect, <laughs> but it's a perfect enough. It's that 80%, you know, where yeah. you'd have to spend a lot more money to get it 90 or 100 but it's enough to where if a pilot's sitting there long enough, they will, mm -hmm. like she said, forget that there's an armrest. There's no armrest, mm -hmm. or we're reaching around the yoke, or, or yeah, it's just amazing to see how people react. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, when you're doing your um, creating your buzz, it's important to know what your talking points are. So for us as an airline, everybody is concerned about safety, of course. And so our number one talking point was uh, we are not taking anything away from pilot training. We're not taking them out of the full flight simulators or away from the instructors. Um, they, they get all the same training they got before, and this is an addition to that. And that's, that's a question that we get a lot. So that was a really important talking point that we needed to get out there, that we needed to make sure the leadership was following through on. Um, and then we did get uh, marketing, got us on the news. Woohoo! Yeah, we were excited about that. Yeah, that was sort of fun that. to be on the news. Yeah. But again, it's, it's one of those things where if you're known as a company that's on the you know, cutting edge of stuff, uh, doing it, new innovative stuff, that is, again, something that's chiching. It's, it's worth money in the bank. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to like quantify it with an actual number. And we did a lot of. Uh, we ended up realizing that this is a good PR tool too. We have an aviation day uh, once a year where uh, a bunch of we have a bunch of kids and their parents come in. It's like Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. uh, and everything in between. And they would come in. The kids put on the headsets. We had all 30 headsets going. We had 30 kids every 15 minutes. It was absolutely crazy. We must have done 300 demos. Yeah. It was an all-day thing. But what that did was that showed all these kids that, hey, I could be a pilot too. This is really neat. This is really great. I could see myself doing this because they were able to go in there and touch all the buttons and all the switches. And the parents are sitting there going, hey, these people are pretty cool. They are being really innovative. And I think next time I fly, I'm flying Alaska Airlines. Yeah, which is another, you know, hard to quantify sort of Very hard to quantify. Yeah. Hey, there we are. There we are. That was our VRversary, our one-year anniversary of starting VR customization. And we had a little party in the office. Yep. That was, that was a fun little get-together. Uh, anyways. Um, Tell us what, what, we, what we're doing in the future, Scott. What would Scott? we like to do, Scott? Uh, the, the, um, we'd like to do some remote training. We'd like to be able to get some of these headsets out into uh, where the pilots are. Um, we'd like to be able to have them take it home instead mm -hmm. of checking it out. Right now, there's only 30. They have to stay in the building. We'd like to be able to check them out to the pilots. They can take them either home, if they're local, I would say, or um, to their hotels, and they can practice by themselves, or they can practice together. The software we have allows both people to be in the plane at the same time so that they can practice their procedures and their flows. Mm -hmm. um, we'd also like to do some 360 videos to prepare them for their uh, simulation events where they um, can watch the uh, flight happen before they get into it. It's all about being prepared. We're not trying to surprise them with, with anything. We just want to make, have them know that this is the procedure you're going to go through when you get in there. Um, we'd like to add some technical, more technical procedures, some emergency uh, procedures, uh, response. There's a certain memory items pilots need to do if there's some kind of decompression. They're supposed to immediately put on their you know, oxygen mask and stuff like that. So we'd like to have kind of gamify some of those things. Um, we'd like to do um, uh, some systems. So if you flip the, one of the hydraulic switches, you get a schematic, an animated schematic of what's going on in your hydraulic system. We'd like to do some checklist discipline. Um, we would we love to get in multiple people in the flight deck uh, for the upgrading captains and they can work through scenarios. Um, we call that crew resource management, but mm -hmm. it's basically leadership. You yeah, know? there's a lot of mentoring that goes on in the airplane from mm -hmm. the captain to the first officer, and actually the other way, too. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times they'll, they'll finish the flight and they'll go, how'd that go? And they talk about it. And so to be able to do that and help them practice that in the headset, mm -hmm. good thing. You're putting your jacket on. Does that mean we're, our time's up? Huh? <laughs> OK. So I just want to wrap up with a little story. This is my lovely daughter. Uh, she's 23 years old. She is not a pilot. She is not in aviation. Um, and she's one of these like kids that read. She learns reading and writing. She is the queen of multiple choice tests. She's not a hands-on learner. So she was home, and she said, ooh, let me see this. And she got in there in under 60 seconds. She was like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and she went through all of the flows in 27 minutes, which is really crazy fast. And she said, yep, yeah, that was fun, but I didn't learn anything. And I said, really? I'm like, where are your thrust levers? She said, oh, right here. I said, uh, where's your landing gear? How do you get your landing gear up? Oh, that's right in front of me. 
And she was putting her hands out to do that. I said, what if there's a fire in the cabin and you can't get out the door? She said, then I take the headset off. <laughs> but she could tell me where the escape rope was. Um, and I, that was just such a powerful experience for me. She wasn't even trying to learn. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir about the, um, uh, how effective these kinds of immersive learning uh, tools are. But wow, she wasn't even trying to learn. Um, so yay. 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 It's exciting. Well, hey, here's the Q&A part. Thank you so much for staying. I know it's late and people want to go to happy hour or something, but yeah. really appreciate your time. Does anybody have questions? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, if people have questions, absolutely. And thank you. Round of applause, these guys. You should be on the stage. You are on stage. OK, questions. No questions? Ah, you have a question. Oh, Alan, it had to be you. The plant. <laughs> I am not a plant, I swear. Um, Alan Gatormson with Horizon Air. My Hello, question Alan. How are is, you? Hi, Scott. My question is, where in the training footprint does the use of the headset land? Um, and uh, how are you going to, or how, how are we going to take this headset and get it approved by the FAA for use? Those are so, two questions. Yeah, that's two questions, man. Okay. You're over your limit. You so first question, where is it in the footprint? It is between the ground school classes. We, they, get, they actually get access to and training in the headsets during their last week of classroom training before they go into their fixed base simulator events. We have two kinds of simulators. One is a fixed base event, uh, fixed base, base simulator. simulator. It doesn't uh, move. It's got all the buttons and things, and they practice their procedures, but it doesn't move. And then they, after they finish those, they move on to the full motion simulator. Um, we have also used this, and this was not, this was unexpected, um, but upgrading captains, when they move to the left seat, their flows are different, and they all want to practice their flows. So we were glad we had those already Imagine customized as well. Imagine everything's being mirrored. You know, now you're over here and used to doing stuff here. Now you're over here and you're doing stuff over here. And you're here. doing totally different stuff. Yeah, too. totally different so, stuff. Yeah. So um, there's that. In terms of how are we going to get this approved by the FAA. Um, they called us. They called us and we've had some discussions with them. I think the first thing that we would like to do uh, right now when we test them on their memory items, they write it down. They just have to pull it out of their head and write it down. Obviously, that's not a performance assessment. And doing that in VR would be a much better uh, assessment of how they perform in the flight deck. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would be our first use case that we would take to the FAA for approval for training, um, training credit. It will not replace full motion simulators. Nope. Nope. This is in addition to. Nope. Yes, sir. Run. Run. Run, run, run. run. Run, Forrest, run. Hello, hi, Michael Hyatt with uh, Northrop Grumman. Oh, all right. Um, I was wondering if um, using VR you un unlocked use cases, like training cases that you couldn't do with a uh, regular simulator or regular uh, training methods. I think what we, basically what it was, was we can't spend all the time some people need in the simulator. So this allows us to do it over and over and over and over until they get it. Um, before it was a time limit. You had two to four hours and you had to get it. Now they can spend as much time as they want. That was the biggest, I think, that we noticed. Yeah, and the users came to us and suggested things. They said, hey, uh, we'd like to practice our checklist. We'd like to go through our abnormal checklist. If something goes wrong, the pilots pull open a book and they have to go through certain steps, you know? And um, all of that we can replicate in the, the headset. I see this being potentially a tool for um, annual training for all of the pilots. They come back every year and they do multiple simulator events. Um, and I see that we could potentially have these available as part of those events when they come back every year. Um, yeah. Like I said, captains, they just keep bringing us ideas and things. Oh, yeah, um, they'd like to be able to do systems. Yeah. I think we talked a little bit about that, <clears throat> being able to like have a, a, a schematic in your hand and be able to flip the switch and be able to see the schematic change mm -hmm. um, in systems class, which is 
what the class before we we have them yeah yeah mm -hmm. so we may be able to put it into that yeah. class too the trick is integrating them into the class we haven't quite gotten that down yet it's an after school so you activity to, you have to train all of your instructors and your instructors have to be really on board with it too yeah um, and they are on board but they're mm -hmm. but we still have to train them up so they can troubleshoot stuff mm -hmm. Hi, great presentation. I'm Thanks. Chip Flory from Boeing. I had a question for you. Boeing, on, 17 uh, years at Boeing. Yeah. Like um, zero years at Boeing. Uh, <laughs> zero years at Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was great to hear the um, uh, Airbus thing. Um, unrelated, yeah. um, question about the, um, so uh, what did you have to do, or did you have to do any um, uh, user scaling for, you were talking about kids in the flight deck, mm -hmm. um, in order for them to reach all of the, the switchology and HMI. No, they were just able to, it just that nope. close, huh? Flight deck's that small. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, they, the visual cues that are in there um, are really easy to follow. They're easy enough yeah. for my 23-year-old non-aviation daughter to, to be able to follow quickly. Some of those smaller kids did have to stand up to flip the switches, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Because yeah. they were really just sitting in these kind of chairs. Yeah. Um, because there's so much that happens around you that you need to have, you don't want to have armrests or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was good for them to sit in that. And yeah, a couple of them had to stand up. Oh my God, the, the kids had so much fun. They and spent a lot of their time um, moving themselves so that yeah. they were on top of the plane or under the plane. They yeah. had a really good time. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. Was they oh, were yeah. moving, you then push the little buttons to move yourself around the flight deck, and you can go outside. And yeah. they, VR Turn pilots got some other in. people out there on the tarmac, mm -hmm. and yeah. one looks mysteriously like my brother. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very yes. much. Yeah, we'll but feel free to contact yeah. us. We would love to talk to anybody else about any of this. Yeah. So thank you okay. so much for your thank time. Thank you. So we are back at quarter to five for the um, night shift. Uh, we have a really big panel from some of the XR providers and then uh, Martin from